guys, and welcome to History Infection. I'm James Gurney, and this time I'm talking about the plague. The plague is a term that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Technically, it comes from the Greek word meaning blow or stroke. In terms of disease, it's normally reserved for our in our minds for the Great Plagues, the uh, the Black Death and the Great Plague of London. In this episode, I'm going to look at the probable cause of agent of the Black Death and other Great Plagues. This agent is a bacterium known as Yersinia pestis. The first probable cause of plague that was probably caused by Yersinia pestis was the Justinia Plague, so called because it thwarted the attempts of the Roman Emperor Justinia in reclaiming the west of the Roman Empire. Obviously, they were based in the east and he was trying to recapture Rome. This plague might have killed up to a quarter of the Mediterranean population. At the height of its wrath, it was killing 10,000 people a day in Constantinople. It's now Istanbul, not Constantinople. Been a long time gone, Constantinople. Later, the Black Death, a different plague but still caused by Eusinius Pestis, made its way across the European continent and then into the UK. In the 14th century, it arrived probably from Bristol and within a few months found its ways into the trendy alleyways and nightclubs and taverns of London, leading to the death of a lot of people within the city and within England. The Scots, taking this as a sort of a sign from God, as you would, I suppose, decided to launch an attack on Durham, only to get an extra spoil of war themselves in the form of the plague. Writing from the time tells of a number of stages of the infection which moved with such quick progression that people would become struck down with pustules to dead within 24 hours. One Irish writer noted, seeing these many ills and that the whole world encompassed by evil, waiting among the dead for death to come, have committed to writing what I have truly heard and examined. And so the writing does not perish with the writer or the work fail with the workman. I leave parchment for continuing the work in case anyone should still be alive in the future, and any son of Adam can escape this pestilence and continue the work thus begun. Then there's nothing but a short note in someone else's handwriting saying, here, it seems the author died, which is about as close as you can come to writing down on paper before you die. The classic symptoms of plague are miasma, that's a general feeling of unwellness, fevers, buboids, which are swellings of the lymph nodes that tend to be closer to the site where the person was bitten by the flea. The initial outbreak of the Black Death Plague killed up to 40% of the world's known populace, and this outbreak was followed by at least another five over a span of 100 years, which finished off another 10% of the people. And tragically and almost harshly, it seemed to focus only on the young and fit and healthy. The plague continued to reoccur throughout the Middle Ages, and the last world outbreak was surprisingly recent, ending in 1955. There's been a lot of speculation about what actually caused these plagues, as the accounts fit the symptoms you'd get from Eusinius Pestis, but the onslaught, the rapid progression, and the lack of some historical accounts of certain signs raised doubts in some people's minds. It must be noticed that the vast majority of biologists believe the plague was caused by Eusinius Pestis, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't look at other alternatives. Recent work, however, looking for the biological DNA signature of Eusinius Pestis in plague victims indicated that these people were probably infected with Yersinius pestis. This means that either the plague was inflated by another circulating pathogen like typhoid or some other disease, or that the disease caused by Yersinia has declined in virulence since that time. But then again, this wouldn't be the first time in history where a disease in antiquity has become less vicious as time has progressed. One problem I have with this explanation of reduced virulence is that the plague is a vector-borne disease. The bacteria is passed from host to host via the mouth of a flea, and an interesting thing could happen when a pathogen is vector-borne. The virulence can become somewhat unchecked. I mentioned this in an episode on malaria. To put it briefly, if you're sick with some disease, for the disease to survive, it needs to get out of you. This is especially true if that disease is actively killing you. Any pathogen that reduces the host's ability to move and help spread the disease plays the price in lowering its transmission. A pathogen that's vector-borne has a different set of rules, as the pathogen doesn't have to worry so much about the host carrying the disease to the next victim. It just has to worry about the vector getting from host to host. So it seems unlikely to me that the plague's causative agent was under the evolutionary pressure to reduce its virulence, but it did kill a lot of people, so maybe it was too successful in its virulence. The understanding of how pathogens respond to virulence and transmission is still somewhat in its infancy, but it's a great topic, and if you're interested, I can recommend hundreds and hundreds, well, maybe not hundreds, a few articles you should go and read about it. The plague comes in three distinct forms, all of which are caused by the same bacteria. You have septicemic, which is a blood bomb, and the rarest, and you have bubonic and pneumonic. Bubonic and septic are spread by the aid of a vector, while pneumonic is airborne and spreads by people essentially breathing you, little droplets of water in the, in the air, getting from an infected person's lungs into your lungs. 
And this is an extremely virulent form of Yersinia pestis. Even today, with the best medicines in the world, the mortality rate of someone who's so, starting to show signs is around 80%. There's a good question why Yersinia doesn't continue to cause such reoccurring cycles of plagues. Several reasons might be that, you know, we've got increased hygiene and there's a reduction of animal and flea hosts and, you know, we just tend to be clean and there aren't so many fleas. Or perhaps the virulence has altered in Yersinia. However, if someone does still get using it today, it's still as deadly as it ever was, in my opinion. And But we can treat it now with antibiotics, as it is a bacteria. There are a couple of other twists. The account of the plague of Justinia, the Black Death, and the Great Plague of London all fail to mention a mass diet for rats. Temporary accounts aren't exactly lacking in detail, so it seems a bit strange that they would not mention this classic and odd phenomenon happening in nature right before everyone gets very sick. So let's restart to some of the history of the plague. Next time I'm talking about how Yersinia actually affects one of its hosts, humans, and the modern history of the discovery of the causative agent. How do people find Yersinia's pesters and how do they link it to the plague? Feel free to subscribe and like this if you enjoyed it and share it around. And I hope you'll join me next time. Thanks for watching. Constantinople. You were date. Constantinople. She waited in Istanbul.